Kia ora, this is Liz. Welcome to my Bible study, Dames Blaze. If you have not watched my intro video yet, can I suggest you go do that now so you know what's going on? Otherwise, grab your Bible and we'll dig in. We are looking today at John chapter 4. We're still talking to the lady at the well. And we're looking today at verses 19 to 26, which makes it slightly longer lesson. Apologies for that. So I'll read that to you now. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just a reminder that the prophet the woman is thinking about is Moses, not say Ezekiel or Isaiah. She appears to be dodging away from the topic of conversation that Jesus was interested in, which was herself. To a wider controversy, sorry, the debate about where they should worship. But before I get into that, let me first clear up a modern misunderstanding of the word worship. To worship, biblically speaking, is not necessarily to sing, although singing may be part of it. The heart of worship comes from the main meaning behind both the Greek and the Hebrew words, which is to prostrate yourself before another, either to kiss the ground or to fall down on the face or to go to your knees. Biblical worship is about posture, in particular, your lowered posture before someone you consider greater and more worthy than yourself. Keep this in mind as we explore the rest of this fascinating conversation between Jesus and the woman of Samaria. So she started, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Whether she's merely dodging away from her questionable lifestyle, or whether she's truly interested in this debate, is hard to decide. Perhaps there's a little of both hidden in the question. Either way, it's worth exploring why she brings this up at all. So to understand the controversy, we must go back to the days of Ezra and Nehemiah during the reign of Artaxerxes of Persia, who was the possible husband of Esther. During this time, Nehemiah, who is cupbearer to the king, wishes to return to Jerusalem and see how things are going. He's given the king's permission to do so, and upon finding the walls a crumbling ruin, he sets about getting them repaired. While he and the other Israelites from the city are trying to get the walls rebuilt, they are harassed and annoyed by a contingent of non-Israelites, one of whom is called Sanballat. He is an Horonite, apparently, which means he either hailed from the city of Beth Haron or from the land of Moab. Either way, he's not a Jew and certainly has no desire to see the Jews re-establish themselves at Jerusalem. It's when the walls are completed and Nehemiah is instrumental in getting proper worship going again that we meet the son-in-law of Sanballat, not given a name here in Nehemiah 13.28, but later called Manasseh. Nehemiah is determined to clear out any priests who've married foreign wives, and so Manasseh is sent packing, or as the Bible puts it, I drove him from me. Sanballat was governor in Samaria, and the rest of the story pertaining to him is to be found not in the Bible, but in the books of the historian Josephus, who tells us in his Antiquities of the Jews that after Nehemiah drove him away, Manasseh went to his father-in-law to complain. Nehemiah had told the priests who were intermarried, that means married to foreign women, that if they divorced their wives, they could stay. When Manasseh turned up at Sanballat's and told him this, Sanballat promised his son-in-law that if he wouldn't divorce his daughter, he would make sure that not only would Manasseh be, ab be able to continue in his priestly role, but that Sanballat would make it his personal mission to make sure that he became a high priest. Now, it was about that time that Alexander the Great came on the scene. He took out the then king of Persia and almost ruined Sanballat's chances, but the Jews themselves played into his hands. 
The newly appointed high priest refused to accept Alexander as the new king, leaving an open door for Sanballat to ingratiate himself with Alex and get into his good books. He was eventually given permission to build another temple in opposition to Jerusalem's at Gerizim. When the temple was finished, he of course appointed his son-in-law as high priest. This temple became a place of sanctuary for the Jews and it stood for 220 years until the then high priest of Judah, Hyrcanus, destroyed it. The ground that it stood on, however, was still considered sacred by the Samaritan people even in Jesus' day and they still performed their sacrifices and rituals upon it. This is, of course, contrary to what the Torah and the words of Moses had told the people of Israel. Jerusalem was the appointed place for the temple and nowhere else, but the Samaritans considered Mount Gerizim holy. They believed it was where Abraham built a shrine after being promised the land, where Jacob ended up living when he returned from Paddan Aram, building a shrine here to commemorate all of that. They also hearkened back to a dictum out of Deuteronomy, where it says, now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put a blessing on Mount Gerizim and a curse on Mount Ebal. They even changed the words in the original scroll of Deuteronomy, specifically Deuteronomy 27.4, which normally reads, therefore it shall be when you've crossed over the Jordan, then on Mount Ebal, you shall set up the stones to, on Mount Gerizim, you shall set up these stones. So the Samaritans then felt they had the right place to worship was Gerizim, not Jerusalem. The Jews, of course, negated that completely, and so the debate raged. Having found herself in the presence of a prophet, the woman asks him to settle this debate. You Jews say that you have to worship at Jerusalem, but our fathers have worshipped here for centuries. So what gives, O oh great prophet of God? Well... He's not going to answer her directly now, is he? I mean, he just doesn't do that. So he does answer her, though. He says, believe me, he begins, which means have trust in what I'm about to say. Be persuaded, because what I'm about to tell you is the truth, the absolute truth, nothing but the truth. Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Actually, that should be an hour, not the hour. There is an hour coming when worship won't be on this mountain or in Jerusalem. In other words, the whole debate doesn't matter in the least because sooner or later it won't matter where you worship. That would have been shocking enough, right? But then he carries on with the ending, worship the father. Now, she had spoken of her fathers twice. She claimed Jacob as her father and that their fathers had given them Mount Gerizim. Jesus now throws that back at her with the preposition the attached. She knows of her fathers, but he knows the father. Now, why is that significant? Well, Jesus answers that with his next statement, right? You worship what you do not know. <laughs> the Samaritans had no idea who or what they were worshipping. They had the first five books of our Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch, if you prefer. So they had the rules and the regulations, but without the prophets or Psalms, how would you know to even relate to God as father? There's a lot of good stuff in these first five books, but... The nature of the relationship between man and God doesn't really start getting developed until later on. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, declares Jesus. There it is, folks. End of debate. The Samaritans didn't really know who or what they were worshipping. The Jews knew exactly who it was, and it's through them that salvation is found. Salvation is sotaria meaning deliverance coming from a root word, sozo, which means to save or to rescue. Salvation then is God's rescue, delivering us from hell and damnation and into his everlasting arms. There is a direct article before the word soteria in the original, making it the salvation. So not just any old salvation, but the full and specific salvation that the Jews had preached on and relied on for centuries. That salvation was coming through the Jews. Though he hasn't answered her question directly, he has in fact answered it. There's only one road to salvation. It doesn't lie on Mount Gerizim. It comes through the Jews. Jesus was relatively unimpressed with his contemporaries and their forms of worship, but the heart of worship itself, well, that was always destined to come through the Jews. Actually, the Samaritans should have known that, because back in Genesis, when Jacob is dying, 
He blesses all of his sons, and in part, this is what he says to his son Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Jewish scholars equate the name Shiloh with the Messiah, and the Samaritans were aware of this, so there really was no need for the debate at all. However, Jesus is settling it. The Samaritans, even the best of them, didn't have it right. The Jews were certainly right about the place of worship. It was meant to be at Jerusalem. But that doesn't mean she needs to go off and move to Jerusalem, because soon enough it will be a heap of rubble, just as the temple at Gerizim had been for centuries. What's more, the style of worship was about to undergo a radical change. <clears throat> no longer would they worship within a temple, but they would worship in spirit. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit. The hour is coming and now is. Before Jesus said only that the hour was coming in regards to the temple rituals, the hour for that to cease was indeed coming but was not yet upon them. Sacrifices were still made at Jerusalem even after his death and resurrection. They didn't stop till the temple was in fact destroyed. However, the ability to start worshipping in the spirit was upon them now. Jesus says that true worshippers are the ones who will worship in the spirit. <clears throat> so who are these true worshippers then? True <coughs> is aleathenos, aleathenos, I think, in Greek. It means real or genuine. John's use of it, according to one scholar, harks back to the Greek use of the word real. It's real in John's case, because it is the full revelation of God's faithfulness. To be a true worshipper, then, is to be worshipping God because you are aware of who he is, his attributes of goodness, mercy, and grace. True worshippers worship the God that is, not the God of their own making. They worship him in spirit and in truth. For true worshippers, it's not about the outward trappings, the long robes, the incense being out there to be seen of all men as the Pharisees did. True worshippers don't make a big deal of their worship. It's part of who they are and it flows into everything they do. In a sense, every action a true worshipper take is done unto the Lord. In other words, they have God in mind. doesn't matter what they're doing. Weeding a garden, caring for a child, making a meal for a husband. Simple mundane tasks can take on a spiritual bent when they are done unto the Lord. These are the types of worshippers that God is seeking. He's looking for people like this fervently and determinedly. It's not just a cursory search for something that is lost. The word for seeking here is tezeo. It means to investigate in order to reach a binding resolution. We might say it is to investigate thoroughly till you get to the bottom of the matter. God is looking for people who will worship him or love him with their hearts, souls and minds, who will offer a sacrifice of themselves. It's hard for us to imagine how Jesus' words would have impacted that woman of Samaria. How would it have gone down, do you think? Do you think she understood what he was trying to tell her? Did she get the idea of worship in the spirit or did it all sound like double dutch? She, like many in that day and age, worshipped by going to a temple or a shrine or a specific place and performing rituals with fire or water or whatever. They did things, you see, things. What Jesus is talking about has nothing to do with doing anything specific. It's not about sacrifices or rituals. What the Lord truly wants is us. Romans 12.1 puts it best. Therefore I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Spiritual worship does not require ceremony, incense, or sacrifices, or even a temple. Spiritual worship is you giving of yourself to the Lord, thanking him for his goodness, glorifying him for his majesty. It is a heart set apart for the Lord's use. We worship in spirit and in truth. The truth of the matter is this. We all fall short of the glory of God. There are none who are truly righteous. No, not one. We do our best. We can call ourselves good people by human standards, or at least most of us can. But it isn't enough to be good. To enter through heaven's gates, to enter into the presence of a holy God, you must be holy. If you're not holy when you enter the gates, you'll be destroyed. 
Do you get that? It's not that God stands there and fires lightning bolts at you. It's that unholy things cannot stand when the truly holy one is about. It's why the idol Dagon was destroyed when the Ark of the Covenant was set before it by the Philistines. Unholiness can just not be around that which is truly holy. Unless we are made holy, which we are by Christ, right? Unless we're made holy, we cannot actually, literally be able to enter heaven. We would be destroyed on the spot. <laughs> it's why Isaiah cries out when he sees God and says, oh, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I live in a people of unclean lips. Isaiah wasn't a bad man as far as I can tell. But even he was aware that being that close to the holy God was likely to see him in ashes. Moses desired to see God and was told that no one could look on the face of God and live. If we want to worship God in spirit and in truth, we must come first in humility through the blood of Christ. We must be honest with our shortcomings and our transgressions. Otherwise, we don't really understand who it is we worship. And we are just as the Samaritans were, worshipping what we don't know or understand. God is spirit, declares Jesus statement that should be obvious to all of us though not so obvious to the Samaritans or many other cultures of Jesus's day having an object to worship was fairly common household gods were normal and still are in many places around the world but the only one truly worthy of worship cannot be presented in an image because he isn't corporal he is a spirit and so to truly worship such a one requires us to worship him in spirit we must get past the letter of the law that dictated every single sacrifice that the Israelites had to give. To get past even our modern ideas of worship, three fast songs, two slow ones. And to find it for ourselves on a personal level, what does it mean for me to worship God in spirit and in truth? In what way is my life worshipping the creator? It's not that we can't go to church and sing. I love worship at church, so I'm not saying that. It's not that we can't have a litany that we speak, right? It's about the spirit that's behind it. I remember having to recite the Lord's Prayer at Brownies. It was a great prayer. It is a great prayer. Of course it is. Jesus taught us to it. It's his prayer. It's great, right? But I repeated it so often that it meant nothing to me. It didn't touch my spirit or my soul. It was just words. If we're going to sing or pray or read the word, then we need to do so with God in mind. We need to consider what we're singing or praying or reading, not just repeat words by rote or let the written ones just float on past our vision. Bible reading is a great discipline, but it shouldn't be about how many verses you've read, but how much thought you've given to what you read. <laughs> Worshipping God is no longer confined to the church or the temple, and it sounds therefore easier, but to worship him in spirit and truth actually takes more work. It takes, at the very least, thought. Jesus slowly stripped away the religiosity that had marked the Jewish worship for centuries. He laid bare the heart of it. It's not about where you do it or how you do it. What makes worship true, what makes it acceptable to God, is what happens inside of you and me. Jesus is summing up for the woman at the well who she's supposed to be worshipping and how. It doesn't appear to have gone over very well, though, because she then says, I know the Messiah who is called the Christ. John puts that bit in for his Greek audience. I know the Messiah is coming and he will tell us all things. It's kind of an abrupt shutdown of everything Jesus has said. It's almost like she's saying, um, right, I think I'll just wait for the Messiah <laughs> and he will tell me what I need to know. I suspect that she no longer knows what to make of this man. And she's not happy with the idea that Gittism has been downgraded to nothing. But how does a Samaritan, with only the first five books of the Bible, come across the idea of a Messiah? And what does she mean by using that word? To us, the Messiah literally means the anointed one and refers to Jesus, specifically the Jesus who was empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring God's plan of redemption to fruition. But how did the Samaritans even understand about the Messiah, given that they only have the Torah? Well, actually, the roots of the Messiah do extend back into the first five books. It starts in the book of Genesis, in fact, with God's curse over the snake. 
We are told there that the woman's seed and the snake's seed will be in enmity and that her seed would crush the head of the snake just as the snake bites his heel. It's also hinted at in the promise to Abraham and the blessing of Jacob to Judah. But the clearest word that the Samaritans would have had was in the book of Deuteronomy, where God says to Moses, or rather Moses says to the people that this is what God said to him, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. If you add to that the fourth oracle of Balaam, which includes a portion of prophecy that mentions a star rising out of Jacob and a scepter out of Israel, you will see that the Samaritans were looking forward to someone coming who they would have ended up calling Messiah based on general conversations with other Jews or hearing the Jews speaking around the temple. It was in the air at the time. That's kind of what I'm getting at. It had to be, <coughs> right, because the numbers stacked up. Daniel's prophecy had numbers attached and the time was ripe. It's actually surprising that they didn't accept Jesus as their Messiah because he didn't indeed come and fulfill prophecy. Not every prophecy by any means because some of those are still to come, but enough of them to actually see who he was. Still, they missed it and it's just as well they did, else the Gentiles, which includes most of us, wouldn't have had a hope. So the Samaritans then understood and were waiting for a Messiah. But their picture of him was based only on those few verses. And given that the prophecy in Deuteronomy was spoken by Moses, it should not surprise you that in all likelihood, what they thought the Messiah would look like was another Moses. A prophet, in other words. Someone who would come and, as the woman said, tell us all things. <laughs> the Samaritans had less of a political view in mind for their Messiah. While the Jews were hanging out for a new David to sweep the Roman oppressors out of their land, the Samaritans were waiting for a new Moses to help re-establish worship on Mount Gittism and explain God to them. Josephus writes that during the last few years of Pilate's governorship, the Samaritan people had a bit of an uprising. They all assembled on Mount Gittism, waiting for the return of the Messiah. They were waiting for him, you see. She was waiting for him. And then she gets the shock of her life. <laughs> I, who speak to you, am he. Or to put it in its proper order, I am he, the one speaking to you, sounds like Yoda. This is one of John's I am statements about Jesus. It is profound and really weird that while Jesus was never quite this open with the Jews or even really with his disciples for a couple more years, he's pretty blunt and open with this random woman by a well. <laughs> Why is that? Well, as I said, the Samaritans didn't have a political view in mind for the Messiah, whereas the Jews did. Had they even had an inkling that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah, they would quite likely have made him king. And if he'd been made king by the populace before he'd done enough to anger the religious folk, he would never have had a crucifixion. It was safe for him to make himself known here in despised and ignored Samaria. There's no way the Jews would believe them anyway. But why reveal it to her? She wants to know him. It doesn't come across well in our English translations. But if we listen carefully to her words, we can hear her heart. She's confused by Jesus' words, but she's intrigued. She wants to know. She is waiting for the one who will tell her all things. Then she'll know what's right and wrong. She'll know where she should worship. Her heart is ready for the truth. We may not see that. Hundreds of scholars who have condemned her as a wanton hussy don't necessarily see that. But Jesus sees that. He always reveals himself to hearts that are ready whether we see it or not she was ready to hear it and so he tells her and she is saved from applying or even reacting by the convenient or perhaps not so convenient return of the disciples and with their return she manages to scurry away what of us though we can't scurry away can we here we are most of us maybe christians of some years standing we can't claim ignorance of who we worship we know him or we should know him so do we worship him in spirit and in truth? Are our lives a daily sacrifice? It's a big ask, I know. And I don't want to leave you feeling like you're failing. I don't think any of us will ever do this perfectly. I know that I don't. There are days when I am fully on the altar and let God tell me what to do. And then there are days when my Scottish soul rises up and yells freedom and I run away and do whatever I want. I mean, we're imperfect creatures, aren't we? As Paul said, the good I want to do, I don't do. And the bad I don't want to do, that I do. 
It's madness, really, isn't it? Madness. We are driven by our impulses, our feelings, our histories, and our habits. It's easy to set proper worship aside and just sing a few songs or read a few verses. True worship takes effort and thought. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm trying to encourage you to try a little harder. To consider God when you wake in the morning. To ask him if there's anything he wants you to do before you start doing whatever you want to do. True worship stems from our opinion of the worthiness of the object that we're worshipping. So ask yourself, is he worthy of your worship? Is he worthy of your time? Job lost all he had. And when the servants came to tell him of the death of his children, he went to his knees, tore his clothes, worshipped. Are we willing to go some way toward that level of sacrifice? It's a lifestyle, really. We can be vegan or vegetarian. We can say we support gays or trees or Mars as a new home. But are we willing to make God our lifestyle? Are we willing to support the things that he would support? Not because we think they are good or honourable, but because he tells us they are. Are we willing to lay ourselves on the altar, to pick up our cross daily, to follow him, to be those who would worship in spirit and in truth? It's a big ask, I know. <laughs> I hope my lesson this week has brought you some ideas to chew on, something to meditate on, something to consider. It's always good if it does that. That's the purpose, I guess. It's not so that I come across as some know-it-all, but so that you can dig in a little deeper yourself and find for yourself some truths that hold you through your days. Um, pray a blessing upon you and your family as a go this week, and I pray that you have a great week. I will see you next week. Ka kite, I know.